This is The Mindful Cranks, and I am your host, Ron Purser. Is the climate crisis a reflection of our lack of understanding of our true nature as human beings in the cosmos? Could our inability to ask such questions be at the root of our collective impotence to affect systemic change that reduces carbon emissions and ushers in the magnitude of cultural change necessary in order to avoid impending and irreversible tipping points? Graham Parks thinks so. In fact, Graham Parks' new book, How to Think About the Climate Crisis, A Philosophical Guide to Saner Ways of Living, published by Bloomsbury in 2021, is exactly that. It's exactly about how to think differently about the climate crisis. By learning from the great ancient wisdom traditions, particularly Chinese philosophies, such as Confucianism and Taoism, appreciating their worldview and ethos to live in in accord with nature, where thriving and flourishing is not individualistic, as we hear a lot about human flourishing among positive psychologists or happiness industry gurus, but instead thriving as a society in a harmonious relationship with the natural world. But as Graham discusses in his book and in our interview, our thinking in the West has been obstructed. It's been taken over by very powerful libertarian ideologies and warped far-right theologies. With the backing of many billionaires and corporate special interest, particularly the fossil fuel industry. Graham painstakingly covers a lot of ground in his book. It's a detailed and well-researched, a very sober analysis, not only of the reality of global heating, but also of the social and political forces obstructing us, which has led to the predicament we find ourselves in today. A native of Glasgow, Graham Parks has taught philosophy at universities in the United States, Europe, and East Asia, and is now a professorial research fellow at the University of Vienna. He has published widely in the fields of European, Chinese, and Japanese thought, with a long-standing emphasis on environmental philosophy. Even in the hour and a half that we spoke, we still only scratched the surface of the many issues and ideas in his book. So I really do hope you get a chance to read it. I'd like to welcome Graham Parks to the podcast. Welcome, Graham. Well, my pleasure, Ron. Really good to see and hear you after our long email correspondence. (laughs) Yeah. Peter Duran, who's a mutual friend of ours, Mm -hmm. he's the one who turned me on to your book, which we're going to Uh talk about. How to Think About the Climate Crisis, A Philosophical Guide to Saner Ways of Living, just published by Bloomsbury in 2021. Peter turned me on to your book. And after I started reading it a bit, I realized that I had read one of your earlier books in the early 90s. I think it was Heidegger and Asian Philosophy or some title like yeah, that? Yeah, he- Heidegger and Asian Thought, yeah, from... And Asian 18- Thought, yes. I, yeah, yeah. I, ha- I have it on my, my uh-huh. shelf here somewhere, yeah. bookshelf. <laughs> and uh, and so that was a really interesting synchronicity, and, and among others. And I mentioned to you on email that I was deeply into studying, at that time, it was called the environmental movement, mm. right? And environmental mm-hmm. philosophy, deep ecology, back in the... Uh, late 80s, early 90s. And uh, through reading your book, you know, I had lost touch with that whole field. I had not been keeping up with the science or anything. Mm. And I was really quite taken aback by all the detail and, and hard research that you put into the book. It really brought me up to speed. So I want to thank you for that. Well, good. That's great to hear because I that 
book took forever to write. I mean, it was really, a, and it went through so many, it, it kept getting bigger and I kept dividing it in half. And then, you know, that half, then it was like an amoeba or something. But uh, yeah, there was a <laughs> lot, lot of work went into that. So I'm, I'm very gratified to hear that uh, you enjoyed it. So before we, before we dive deep into that, I thought maybe we could start a little earlier and, and, and backtrack a bit in t- terms of how did you get into philosophy? I mean, what, what drew you in that direction? And uh, I think that would be a good place to start. Okay, that takes us back then to 1967, or in fact, even earlier, when I was finishing up school, there was a group of pseudo-intellectuals that called themselves the Humanists, and a defiantly secular name. And they read books one, once a month, and they discussed them after school, sort of late at night. Uh, <clears throat> we smoked cigarettes and drank black coffee. We, we, were, we thought we were very cool. And the second book we read was Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra. And I realized this was something was going on. I didn't understand a word, really, but in retrospect. But I realized no, no, this is fascinating. This is really interesting. And I read on the back cover of the, I think it was the Hollingdale translation, Friedrich Nietzsche was a German philosopher who did, so I thought, okay, so what does a philosopher do? I didn't know. So I asked around and someone said, well, philosophers get paid to sit around and think. (laughs) <laughs> I thought, well, that sounds like that sounds like nice work if you could get it. Uh, That's a good gig. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> now, what they didn't say was you have to go to committee meetings and and right. uh, uh, grade papers and all that kind of stuff. So I looked into it and um, uh, ended up. I uh, won a, a scholarship to Oxford, and so I ended up studying philosophy there which was analytic philosophy. This was 1967, Mm -hmm. as I said. But also, 1967 in Oxford, there was a lot of psychedelics coming in from Switzerland in those those days. And that just, that just, uh, did it for me. I mean, that was, I was from Glasgow. I had, I had not experienced anything stronger than beer before, before I got there. And this, these just opened my mind in a way where I thought, well, this is fascinating. What on earth is going on? Because whatever was going on, it seemed more real than what I was used to for the, what, 18 years of my life up to that point. And so I thought, well, I, I this, this is worth studying. And a number of people recommended William Blake, and I should read this mystical poetry and so on, which I did. But then someone recommended the Tibetan Book of the Dead. They said, this would be a, a good place to start. <laughs> so I read that, and I thought, wow, this is, I mean, these people are onto something really important. And I think that was what, you know, that trajectory that began there with with psychedelics, I I was interested in saying, so what is going on? What is happening here? And and also, would there be a way of accessing this level of experience without the psychedelics? And so Mm -hmm. when I got to Berkeley, I know we, we have some common interests and friends there. When I got to Berkeley in, that was 70, there was everything from from Ayurveda to Zen was available there. And so Tibetan Buddhism, Zen also, I gravitated towards because I thought there's something about these practices that is accessing something similar. And I suppose I still, I suppose I still think that my practice such as it has been has opened up or keeps reminding me of those early experiences of just thinking, well, there's something else going on here that is deeply different from what everyone has told me is happening in the world. So, yeah, and I found philosophy also, I mean, as I say, mostly the, I started with Indian, but then got more into Chinese and Japanese thought, but also on the Western side, people like Nietzsche, I found extremely and Heidegger as well as you as you mentioned so yeah so I've I've been fortunate in 
having had a career where I actually, I did get paid to think a bit <laughs> along with all the other stuff. Yeah, it's been, it's turned out, I mean, of course, I'm still thinking and still trying to figure out what's going on, but, but I feel I might have made some kind of progress in the last 50 years or so. And you spent quite a bit of time in Hawaii, right? And you were, was that the East West mm -hmm. Center? Uh, no, that was the University of Hawaii, although the East West Center is on the campus, on, on the UH campus. So we did have relationships between the philosophy department there and the East West Center. And uh, yeah, that was a lucky, that was another stroke of luck after what? nine years in California, that job came up, I applied for it. And it was just the perfect place for me because that department was so pluralistic, it still is. They had people doing Chinese philosophy, Japanese philosophy, Islamic philosophy, Jewish philosophy, Indian philosophy, and some Western philosophy as well. And so I really felt in my element that pluralistic approach was really a wonderful Thing. It made for rather difficult politics. When the politics got bad, they were really bad because there were so many different interests at stake. But mm -hmm. but it was it went up and down, you know. And in, in the good times, it was a, a great place to be. Yeah. But it was at, uh, when you were at Berkeley as a grad student that you first became more interested in environmental philosophy and the environmental movement. Right, that's that's true because this was the way it was in California. I mean, the, well, you know, you're there, right? I mean, the coast, the the redwoods, the I mean, the Sierra Nevada. I just couldn't believe it, and yet at the same time, it seemed like it was already being destroyed. I mean, there were forces yeah. at work that were, well, capital, good old capitalism that were destroying the natural world. And, you know, in those days, of course, there were the, the government was very uh, proactive in it was the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and so on. So it was encouraging that even though there were forces working toward the destruction of the planet, that you could see regulation and you could see people being concerned about it and so it was hard to believe because some of that happened under nixon even yes exactly under, no you <laughs> yeah you think weird. back yeah you <laughs> think back and you realize no the republicans were were all for it too i mean it was yeah it was an amazing time and so that was yeah it was a very those were very formative years because i was talking to a lot of people who were concerned about about the environment and for a while i was sort of giving, I didn't get paid very well in Hawaii relative to the cost of living. So I was giving a small amount of my salary to environmental causes. But then I realized, no, wait, why don't I teach this stuff? Why don't I get the students thinking about what's happening? And so, mm. yeah, that started back back then in the early 80s, I suppose. Yeah. 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 I think that it, I came into it a little bit later than you, of course, but I think we were reading the same sort of books, those early books like uh, by Garrett Hardin and Rachel, Rachel Carson, mm -hmm. Lynn White, E. F. Schumacher, and uh, yeah, yeah, those books must have really shaped your thinking too at the time because those were quite pioneering books. Yeah, they really did, and and that's what I think I, I mentioned some of them in that book of mine, the climate crisis book, because yeah. when I look back, I realize. It was all be it was all being understood at that point. People realized yeah. what was going on, what was needed, what kind of changes were needed in our attitude. And yeah, there was even was, a book called the Club of Rome report. Do oh yes, that right, right. I remember that well. Yes, yeah. limit limits to growth. Limits to growth. Yes, yeah. yes. And yes. that made so much sense back then. And there were, you know, what amazes me is there were. A lot of people, quite important politicians involved in that movement, you know, and I think everything right. they were pointing to back then, you know, we're still trying to deal with now and not, not dealing with it very well. Yeah. I'm not going to ask you that because the reasons <laughs> seem to be right in our face. But I will ask you if it was difficult writing this book because the first half of your book reveals quite a large amount of depressing facts and a very sober analysis, the reality of climate change and global heating. 
So I was wondering, it was it? I mean, the, some people talk about climate anxiety, climate depression. Was it difficult to write write this book? Yes, or, it was. I mean, I was <laughs> I was chronically depressed <laughs> during that time. No, it was hard, and I, I debated. I mean, I, because that first half was a lot longer in earlier versions, but I realized that it's important to. You know, I, I, I'm trained in philosophy. That's that's what I was wanting to get to. But it struck me that I think it goes back to Aristotle who says, well, you can have the best will in the world to do the right thing. But if you don't understand the situation, mm-hmm. you could be doing things that make things worse rather than, than, than better. And so I realized from my decades of teaching courses on climate, or first of all, environmental philosophy, and then later on climate change, that the, the students didn't know that background. You know, they didn't know the science. They didn't know how serious the situation is. They didn't know about the obstructions to making progress that come out of the, yes, as you mentioned, the, the libertarian, <laughs> neoliberal the billionaires. And so I thought it's important to to lay that out. And it was hard to do because I thought, I, I need, this is so depressing. I need to get beyond this and get to my and our generation. Just did, didn't know, uh, you know, didn't understand the situation well enough. Well, we'll get to those three obstructions. But one of the things that impressed me, though, was it felt like a, you know, I took courses in systems thinking and systems theory, very interrelated sort of strands that are all working in unison in terms of creating this disinformation campaign. But before we get into that, I think I'd like to start with you say early on that we're in this predicament that has to do with our ways of knowing. And you relate that to the myth of Prometheus or the Promethean myth. And I'm Mm -hmm. wondering if you can unpack that a bit. Yes, okay. I had an interest from early on in Berkeley in in in-depth psychology. In, in Freud, in Jung, there's a man, I don't know if you know him, James Hillman, oh, yes, who died yes, a few years uh-huh. ago, uh, who, who I met, I got to know him, uh, uh, oh. and he was a great inspiration. I never had a mentor. I always thought, that's it, don't you, if you go to universities, don't you get a mentor somehow, someone that you look up to and follow? I never had that. But it, in a sense, James Hillman was, was my mentor just, just through having met him. Uh, through some friends of mine, and um, you know that that uh, uh, the notion of depth psychology, that mythical enactment, that unconsciously we are driven by these forces that we can understand if we read the right stories, if we if we're acquainted with the right myths, and it began to seem to me more and more that the myth of Prometheus, you know, people focus on the fire and, and, and that's right. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I think we're, uh, we're a pyromaniac species. We just, I mean, we're, we're obsessed with fire and of course, human culture, the way it is, I mean, and our civilization is totally based on fire, burning things, burning fossil mm-hmm. fuels. And, but we don't really see it nowadays because you look at the at a power station, a coal-fired power station from the outside, you don't see any flames. It's all concealed. But, but of course, that's, that's where we get the electricity is, is through burning stuff. And when you look at the Prometheus myth, and you see, okay, so he's the titan who defied Zeus, the, the keeper, the maintainer of, the, of order in the world, in order to give human beings fire. So it's a gift from, the, from Prometheus, but it's actually stolen goods. So I think there are a number of reasons to be, to be skeptical of it, to think, ah, oh, this, you know, I mean, they talk about the expression playing with fire i mean that was a dangerous gift and but it was not only fire it was also the arts that make us comfortable the you know house building ship building mining medicine quite i mean a whole range of stuff that prometheus got from the gods and gave to us to 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 make life more comfortable so and the making of tools techni right 
Yeah, technai. right. And exactly. They <laughs> and that's exactly what they were called. They were called technai from from that that Prometheus gave us. So he gave us these technologies, these tools, and. I mean, it's not that they're in themselves problematic because they could be used sustainably, but it does seem to me that we just went overboard, uh, you know, driven by that uh, that uh, uh, that Promethean drive, as I call it. So it took it too far. Of, it's a form of hubris, in a sense. Then yes, right, right. We, we we've not been we've not been looking at the at, at the consequences of of all that burning, and. When you, when you think of the Prometheus myth, and I think of that wonderful painting by Rubens, uh, where Prometheus is almost upside down, he's on the mountain, the, the eagle is pecking out his liver, and, the, and this is happening over a period of several thousand years, and you think, man, this is one hell of, <laughs> this is a dangerous business here. Uh, look at the consequences of this theft of fire and so on. So, yeah, so I think it's, 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 it's something that, that helps us see what we're doing in a way, that story, that myth. It, it also seems that this, this gift of technology or techne, uh, it seems like it's shaped our way of knowing to such a degree that our way of knowing has become completely instrumentalized and in terms yeah. of that it's dominating our human capacity uh, for how we know that there's mm-hmm. only this narrow sort of means and way of knowing. Is yeah. that part of yeah. this? Is yeah, that, yeah uh, that's uh, right. Right, that's 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 yeah. very much part of it because I mean I've long thought I mean I, I I suppose this is one way of thinking about how philosophy might help us, where you acknowledge okay, you're in caves, you're wearing animal skins and so on and so forth. Your time is pretty much taken up by surviving, or by doing what you have to do to survive. But once you have a little leisure time and you can reflect on on life and and not everything you see and know is driven by that imperative to drive for self-preservation then you see things you can see things very differently and the 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 philosophers i think from both the eastern and the western traditions would say yeah and you can really learn a lot from as it were turning off the instrumental side of our intellect, you know, and just saying, okay, so let's not think in terms of means and ends for a while. How does the world look then? Well, it looks totally different. And of course, we we have to survive. We have to, I mean, most of us have to have a job and and we have to work. But, But that's, but I think you put it well that then that takes over that has taken over that instrumental attitude toward the world taken over our our way of knowing and being and experiencing and so on and then you get problems because i mean i think heidegger saw this well you know he said that yeah. that then gives you a a take on the world that is very narrow in a sense i mean necessary for survival but but relegate it to you know keep it in its place as it were would be the the advice. Yeah, I I used to do management and organizational consulting way back, and I remember I was working at this Fortune 100 company, and this R and D manager said, "I want tools. I want tools that will kill." <laughs> you know, it was like it was just like I need these these tools. You know, straight talker. Um, yeah, but yeah. it seems like it it relates to what you said with Heidegger is that. As a culture or a problem in modernity, is we haven't really learned how to question technology, so to speak. Right, right, right. And I think that that essay of his, of Heidegger's, from the from the, what early fifties, I think, that I think's best translated in technology. That's what he's doing. He's not dismissing it. He's not saying it's no right. good, but he's skeptical about it. And I think that's what we desperately need now, because otherwise, what do people? What do people go for with the iPhone 16 or whatever they're at now? There's no question. I I have to get it. I need it. Well, no, you don't need it, maybe. You, and, <laughs> yeah. and maybe you don't need I mean, the, so that's really, I think, an important thing to, to for, for students, too, to think about. That, yeah, uh, questioning, which I think is really what philosophy is about. I mean, if it's the one word... <laughs> 
if you say, okay, so con- philosophy is so different in the Chinese or Japanese tradition or Indian from the Western, but is there one word that would cover what we do on both sides of that, you know, globally, as it were? And I think questioning is, is the one word. And that philosophy is about questioning and questioning things that we don't normally think we need to question. And I think that's really the, 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 val- the value of Heidegger's approach is that he says we're actually being controlled by the technology. We think we're in charge, but actually yeah. it's using us. And therefore, oh, yeah, it's we, trained us well. we need to yeah. question. Yeah, right. <laughs> therefore, we need to question it. And, uh, and, you know, of course, I mean, I think, I mean, the grips, getting to grips with the climate crisis, well, of course, technologies are going to play a major role. But the question is, which ones and how? And I think the reason that, you know, one of the things that I can't really understand now, uh, nowadays about the world is the situation is so obviously grim. And even if you lay it out for people, they don't get it. They're, they're, no, no, no. It, it, it'll be okay. They're overestimating the dangers and so on. I don't think they are because behind a lot of this is this belief, this Promethean uh, faith that, oh, we'll find some new technology. It's now mm-hmm. the one that will allow us to suck the CO2 out of the air. Right. Well, mm-hmm. yeah, good luck with that. I think <laughs> we'll probably manage it, but it, it won't be soon enough. You know, it'll, it'll, uh, it'll be a, a long time in the future. But so many models where people say, no, no, here's how we do it. They depend on this magical technology that we actually won't materialize, I don't think. Uh, they say, oh, yeah, we'll uh, have it next year or, or in a few years. Uh, yeah, it's, it's sort of a global engineering vision of global engineering. <laughs> technocratic yeah, uh right right i mean that the don't let's get started on geoengineering because i mean that's geoengineering that's a, yes yeah, yeah that again is what people are putting their faith in and you just think this is exactly a uh, 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 Zhuangzi, the taoist philosopher has has a wonderful uh uh, uh there's a wonderful passage in Zhuangzi where he says you know the the our uh, our life works within limits, but our understanding has no limits. And he says, if you let your life be ruled by your understanding, you're soon going to get into trouble because what's leading your life is something that has no limits. And and therefore, you begin to think, well, my life doesn't have limits either. But Well, I think it, that's why we see people wanting to, the billionaires wanting to go into outer space and go to Mars and Right, right, and that should be a real sign to us that that they're up to no good because, of course, <laughs> they realize what they're doing is destroying the planet. They'll be fine going out, but uh, they'll leave the rest of us here. But then again, I think this is a fascinating thing. I mean, I I can't wait for them all to go because look at the uh, what was that 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 space uh, the people that went into in, into orbit for a year. And they came back, and the studies show all their DNA got messed oh, yeah. up. I mean, yeah, it's horrendous. You can't survive out there. You know, it's, it's... not good for the human body. But uh, sure, let them try. I, I'm yeah. all for, <laughs> for for seeing them go as soon as possible. This is a great transition because we're getting now into talking a, a bit about the billionaires and these three obstructions that you've mm. articulated. And so why don't you walk us through briefly? The first one I think is what you refer to as the climate deniers and the libertarian billionaires and fossil fuels, right? Right, right. Who are, who are very, many of them are are both in, 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 in the fossil fuel industry. And of course, you, under, you can understand that, that they have trillions invested in the infrastructure and so on. And so they're damned if they're going to lose all that money in the transition to a low carbon and zero carbon economy. Yeah, Uh, I think you even mentioned that even like Shell, that of course, all this greenwashing with these petrochemical companies with their commercials and public service sustainability, but 99% of Shell's investment is still in fossil fuels. 
Right, right, right. It's it's and it, they've been in the news recently. Both Exxon and Shell are posting record profits, thanks mm-hmm. mainly to the war in Ukraine, which is one country over from here in Vienna, one country to the east. No, it's obscene because no, their greenwashing is unbelievable. They're spending hardly anything on renewable energy, and they're investing heavily in finding more fossil fuels to burn. And, you know, you're mentioning the man who was talking about the tools, the tools to kill. I remember yeah. when I was in Berkeley, there was a man, James Ogilvy, who was a, he- yeah. a Hegel a scholar future, who wrote... Kind of a futurist. Yes, <laughs> right. And he gave up philosophy early on <laughs> and became a consultant about the future. And That's right. I remember that he was advising Pacific Gas and Electric, and this was in the mid-70s, and he was saying to them, look, you guys need to rethink yourselves, revision yourselves, Mm -hmm. not as fossil fuel burners, but as energy providers. Right. And I've Mm -hmm. I've never forgotten that. That was the mid-70s, he was saying that. That that was scenario, scenario planning. Scenario yeah, yeah. planning, yes. Right, right, exactly. And when you think what they knew, they knew in those days that their product was was screwing up the climate big time. They knew it. You know, their scientists were actually very good scientists, but they kept it quiet. And I mean, damn, I, I mean, I hope nobody has compa- <laughs> has compassion for for these guys because they knew that stuff back then, fifty years ago. And they kept on, they had no interest in revisioning what they were doing. They just kept on doing it. Yeah, and I think it's, there it's, was some report recently about just how far back Exxon knew about this and they made sure that that information was suppressed. It reminds me very much of the tobacco industry and their campaign to, their disinformation campaign as well. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I think, you know, that book by... Naomi Oreske is called Merchants of Doubt, lays that out very nicely, just shows here's the way the tobacco industry did it, and look at the parallels with with big oil and the fossil fuel industries. One of the other themes that you weave under this first obstruction, which I, I thought you did a wonderful job doing, is that this is really a concerted strategic war of ideas. Mm, can mm, you can you talk mm-hmm. more about that? Yeah, well, that right, that's really it starts here in Vienna because it's it's that school of economics that wanted the von Hayek, Friedrich von Hayek was went then to London and he was the first to use this this term. He called it the battle of ideas and he said this is the way you have to work. You have to get the right ideas out into the public sphere and therefore into politics and it's got to it's got to further individualism keep the free market free and and everything that went into the whole neoliberal nightmare that we're still living in and by the way I, that was what blew me away about about your like mindfulness is we have the same we've identified the same enemy here because i mean in economics it's called more neoliberal than libertarian but it's when you put individualism and the freedom the freedom of the market front and center it's also a, a war of ideas. It's ideas about who we are, basically. You know, very. Yeah, it's a vision of, of human nature and in a, yeah. of the human being too. Right, right, and that we are creatures of desire, which of course most philosophies would agree with. But that, but that we're basically consumers, and that as long as we are in a position to satisfy our desires, we'll. Yeah, we will we'll lead fulfilled lives, and 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 that went along with something that I think um, someone like Schumacher, whom you mentioned earlier, in Small is Beautiful, he lamented that economics was becoming so important, and and economists were were be, you know they were like demigods or so, or so on, and you know we're starting to nobody can do anything in politics without saying well wait a minute what are the economic consequences of 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 doing this, and I think he quotes it but is it um, 
who was it that uh, Keynes, I think, said, you know, what would be wonderful is if economists could think of themselves as on a level of dentists. We need dentists. They do a good job, but they're not gods, for heaven's sake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we still, we still got that thing that economics kind of rules politics, and it's, it's not helpful, not at all. Mm-hmm. And so, anyway, yes, in that war of ideas, I'm thinking, wait a minute, don't philosophers aren't they are aren't we meant to know something about ideas? Where are the philosophers pushing back in that war and saying to the libertarians and the neoliberals, no? That's a stupid way of understanding who we are. It's just, it's bankrupt. It's, it's going to, well, you can see where it's led us. It's, it's led us into a, a major crisis. And there are other ways of understanding what it means to be a human being. Well, unlike philosophers sitting in universities, their ideas have financial backing by mm. the billionaire class. Yeah, yeah, that and that makes a difference. That makes a difference. Rupert Murdoch and uh... yeah, yeah, they they still call the shots, and 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 this is what amazes me Coke is brothers. that yeah, yeah, right. That up until this point, it's clear that the political systems of most countries in the world have been bought by these interests, these people that that want to see us and want us to see ourselves as consumers. And they continue to be able to rig the system so that they can continue to make vast profits. And you know, the rich have been getting richer much faster in the last since the pandemic hit and so on. The equality, the gap, the inequality is just, it's taking off. And I suppose there are some good signs. You probably saw that, what, at Davos, in that latest round of talks, that a number of billionaires were saying, please tax us more heavily. <laughs> please let us pay more taxes. And yeah, things like that have to happen. And, and to go back to Exxon and Shell, they both po- posted record profits this past year. And of course they need to be taxed. <laughs> it's, we have to rein in this, this insanity, it seems to me. I was also quite surprised to learn Ayn Rand, who is worshipped by many of, of these neoliberals, but I was surprised to learn that even Steve, Steve Jobs of Apple was a fan of hers. I didn't know that. Yes. Yeah. No, she had, and I, I, I think still there are people in, or at least there were in the Th- last- Peter of, Thiel? P- Peter Thiel? Yes. Yeah, yeah, people in the last administration too in the US and people in the UK government um, are still obsessed with that in, in, uh, hyper individualism, which I don't think. Um, uh, I mean, I read a thing recently about a man, at, a professor at Harvard, who wrote a book on. I mean, people have been writing books. He's one of these happiness experts. Oh. And. Something that's really telling is that the studies of what do people say on their deathbeds? What do they regret about their lives? Well, very few of them say, I wish I'd made more money uh, or I wish I'd worked harder than I did. What most of them say is, I wish I'd invested more in human relationships. And Mm -hmm. that seems to me from the Buddhist standpoint, from the Confucian and Taoist standpoints, from the standpoint of most other philosophies than the war of ideas, the neoliberal ones, that's the point. That's what you lose if you see yourself as an individual. You are not autonomous. You need other people. You are related whether you like it or not. And yeah, it's, it, it's, it, seem, it seems like it's just a, a way of uh, promoting even more delusion, the fact that we're self-existing independent entities that have no relationships it's quite delusional yeah it is it's totally delusional and it's a it's a wonder that more people don't see through it but i suppose that if you control post-industrial capitalism that's part of your job is to keep people happy and not thinking about that to keep them occupied with getting more stuff and so on And not thinking, is this actually making me happier? Which apparently it doesn't usually. So another, the second obstruction, you characterize that as the political power of the far right. Yeah. 
yeah, and the religious right especially. The religious right, yes. Yeah, yeah. And that's, gosh, that's still a big one, I think. I mean, <clears throat> and mostly a U.S. thing, but gosh, yeah. thank heavens we don't have Bolsonaro in charge anymore in, in Brazil. But he was, he was raised Catholic and then converted to evangelical uh, by getting baptized in the River Jordan. There's a wonderful video of him. But man, he almost brought about the destruction of the Amazon rainforest. It's horrendous. And I think they're still very powerful. And it, it's not, um, I think I, I, I say in the book, because the more I looked into this, the more I realized, no, it's not actually, it's not actually the evangelicals per se, but it's the right-wing individualist uh, camp of the evangelicals who are very powerful and and have this notion that in fact probably destroying the planet would would be a good thing because then we'll have the rapture we'll get you know we'll get to the to the next to the next life um, to the kingdom of God sooner and that has so that's been really a- quite an aberration and an exception to to Christianity I mean it's a really warped view. Right, uh, right. It's it, uh, uh, you're right. It's totally. It's a very selective <laughs> reading of the Old Testament, especially the the you know, thou shalt have dominion over the earth that part, and ignores the whole of the New Testament and, and the teachings of Jesus, who was saying, no, no, we're a community. We are, we are a communal beings, and and we ought to be loving our neighbor more than ourselves. But uh, no, it is a very warped uh, idea of who we are. And I mean, Harold Bloom has a wonderful book called The American Religion, where he shows this is what happened to Christianity when it got to the new world. It, it started to see the drama of salvation as being played out between the individual soul and its maker. And if that's where it's at, then... I'm sorry, Ron, you don't matter to me. My family doesn't matter. The natural world doesn't matter. None of this stuff matters. It's just me and, and the creator. And if you, if you have enough people believing that, you have a problem. And, and as, you, as you point out in the book, that this, the war on science seems to be related to that, but also how key politicians, both in the Senate, in the House, in our Congress, are also propagating this warped view of nature and our place in nature too. Exactly, exactly. And I can't believe that they're still doing this. I read just the other day that some Republicans somewhere saying the climate, I mean, it, it has natural, it's subject to natural variation. You know, we don't really know that we're doing this. Well, come on. Of course, you know who who discovered natural variation were the climate scientists. You know, they went back and they looked at ice cores and so on and so forth. So all their models are are premised on on yes, of course there's natural variation. But they factor that into all their climate models and so on and and no, it's it's something rather unnatural has been happening recently since we since the industrial revolution. That's a clever way of cherry picking and having good sound bites. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. But you you do bring up this senator in Hofe. Oh, I don't oh know in Hofe. Yes, yeah, in Hofe. Right, uh, right. Yeah, and yeah. he wrote a book called "The Greatest Hoax." Yes, yes. <laughs> no, and he was he was really. I mean, he's emblematic of of that cherry picking. You know, he's not stupid. Uh, so he. Did he read enough about science to be able to make speeches where you think, oh, maybe he understands you know, what's going on? But then, no, he doesn't really, because he's, his ideology has only let him see a certain part of the science that he then cherry picks. And these people are still convincing many people in the world you know, and, and you think, you think, why? Why are they managing to do that? Well, it's because I think so many people would like to believe that. Oh, it's okay. It's not so bad. You know, they're telling they're telling people that there's a great, there's a whole 
I mean, there's a boom in publishing now where you publish books that tell people what they want to hear. And if they're about climate, you say, oh, yeah, maybe it looks bad. And now they don't say so much that that the planet isn't heating up. They admit that it is. But then maybe we're not doing it. Or if we are, it'll be good because more CO2 means plants grow better. Um, But it no, it doesn't make it, it. It's I mean. That's that's something that people need to see. I mean, I think the maxim that says follow the money or look behind where's the money coming from here is very helpful there because so many people make a lot of money by denying the science but telling people exactly what they want to hear. Yeah, and the fact that uh, they control these key Senate chairs of these committees, I mean, I, I believe he was the chair of the Senate Committee on the Environment. Yeah, he was. I mean, he had two terms. He came back. Yeah, uh, yeah. no, he, I mean, he did untold amounts of damage, that guy. Well, that brings us to obstruction three, and mm. you characterize it as big tech. And why is big yes. tech the third obstruction? <clears throat> well, okay. I mean, uh, if you ask my daughter, she would say, well, don't listen to my dad because he doesn't even have a smartphone. <laughs> uh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. But uh, but I listen to her. She does have a smartphone. I hear about it through her. Um, yeah, I, it seems to me that 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 big tech and of course you mentioned Peter Thiel. So many of them are full on libertarians. Um, move fast and break things, you know, I'll do it until someone stops me. It's a totally, and lots of Ayn Rand uh, fans, as you pointed out, it's a totally libertarian driven dream. And it's so important because it conditions the lives of so many people all over the world. And they, I, I, as far as I can tell, they're not, they're not very interested in saving the planet. They're interested in, in making money. And they do that by diverting our attention away from where we're at, where we are physically, and putting it off to some virtual realm somewhere where they can sell us stuff based on all the data that they've, that they've collected about us. Yeah, I think, and this is the problem with climate change, is it's, you can't do it in a soundbite. You have to be patient. You have to say, okay, there are certain things we need to understand about how the world works. And you can't do it on TikTok in under 60 seconds. It, it, it takes longer yeah. to, to lay it out. And so I, my fear is that, I mean, I think it's beginning to change, but that I think that a lot of young people who are the people who are going to be really taking it on the chin with the climate. It's funny because I used to say to my students, look, this is, I don't have a personal stake in this. I'll be long gone when it gets really bad. And I'm getting pretty old (laughs) and I'm thinking, wait a minute, it's already getting really bad. Maybe I won't be long gone. But but yeah, it's the, the younger generations are going to be taking the hit. And it's uh, tragic that they are being so successfully, their attention and energies are so successfully being diverted away from, because I, I don't think that, you know, what, what you see on your phone and what people are scrolling through on TikTok, especially, it's not a whole lot about climate change there. You know, it's not there. That's not what's where their attention is being directed to. And I think so you I even think- cite some studies that show just how little content there is on climate change on these platforms in your book. Yeah, yeah. It's not a popular topic because, of course, it's not a fun topic by any means. But I think that's something that a question I'm asking myself a lot recently is, is the – because you mentioned climate anxiety and a lot of people are having it, have it. I mean, I have it for heaven's sake. But – how do we deal with that? Well, I have a dictum that says that action alleviates anxiety. It's the three A's. Well, no, five A's because it's almost always. <laughs> that anxiety is this, is this pent-up energy. And if you can get out there and do something, then that relieves your anxiety. And, of course, the, it was happening in, in what, 2019, 
Greater Thunberg and the, the Fridays for Future movements and so on. All over the world, young people were taking to the streets and then we had the pandemic shut down. So you know, it, it got, everything got put on hold. But I hope that, that young people can see, no, no, rather than, of course, if we get paralyzed by anxiety, then the worst will happen. But if we can take action and do something, we'll not only relieve our anxiety, but we'll actually manage to make this, the situation less bad than it would otherwise be. I was also surprised if you take a company like Google, which is one of the tech titan, Google's motto is do no harm. But I was shocked to, to discover that most of these tech titans support climate denial organizations and disinformation. I did not know that. Yeah, they really do. They, it is part of the libertarian mindset, I think, because they, I think if you're a libertarian, you can't even conceive that what we need is some kind of a social revolution, a movement that, of people being together, of coming together, because we're individualists. We do it alone. And no, I think it's totally shameful the amount of content that they allow. I think Google, Facebook, Twitter, all, all these social media platforms, that they're full of, again, it's they're full of climate denial stuff because that's what people want to see. That's what people want to be told. And yeah, there's, there's very little sense that I can see of social responsibility in that business model that goes under the rubric of do no harm. It's, uh, it's a sad irony, that one. Yeah. That brings up the politics of China. And we'll get into talking about how Chinese philosophy could be a corrective to our highly individualistic way of seeing ourselves. But before we do that, you make a case that we need to take China seriously and we need to rethink our relationship with with China in terms of di diplomacy and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, gosh, that's they're not making it easy for us right, right. now. But, but I do think that if you look back, <clears throat> that we in the West, and I, I think the EU is as guilty as the US in, in, in this respect, that we have looked down on China for a long, long time. I mean, we've, we've just been dissing them <laughs> from start to finish as, yes, a poor country that's well, somehow become rich, and you know, so now we have to talk to you. But the Chinese, Xi Jinping especially, in his early days, it wanted to reset socialism with Chinese characteristics from Deng Xiaoping, from the Deng Xiaoping era. He said, we want to make that ancient Chinese characteristics. We want to set socialism, Marxist socialism, ground it in our own tradition. And that seems to me a totally sensible way of going about things, that, that to run a country as big as China on the basis of Karl Marx, whom I greatly admire, but he is German, <laughs> he's not yeah. Chinese. They are saying, okay, and of course, and in many ways, the humanist Marx, Marxism as a humanism, is very compatible with the Confucian tradition that was then being brought back by Xi Jinping. So I was very encouraged when in, what, 2000. 14, 13, 12, when Xi Jinping took, assumed power, that when he was saying this, I thought, well, okay, this is hopeful. And our response from the West had better be, yes, we get it. We understand. We appreciate Chinese civilization as one of the world's great civilizations. And, and you look at the achievements in, from science to painting to poetry to philosophy, it's a, one hell of a civilization. And it was clear the Chinese were very upset by our not acknowledging that, by our saying, no, we had the enlightenment, we, had, we got reason to bring us up to the truth and so on and so forth. You guys didn't have that, so we're not really going to talk to you until you acknowledge that we've got the truth. That, that, that's not going to get us anywhere with the Chinese. So, yeah, my, what I'm saying in the book, I still want to say is that, yeah, 
if we could acknowledge the value of these Chinese ideas from the Confucian and Taoist traditions, that they are, I think, very relevant to where we're at now in the world, the Chinese would, if we were to tell them that, to say, yeah, we acknowledge the greatness of your tradition, I think that would change a whole lot. That would make them a lot easier to deal with. But as long as we have this superior attitude of we had the Enlightenment, we had the technological, industrial revolutions, we did it all, we Westerners. And especially now that we see what we did was that we exported that way of understanding who we are as human beings all over the world because the Chinese went for it, the Japanese went for it, and went for it because it was obviously going to make us richer or more prosperous or whatever. And so I think a lot of a civilization, a lot of cultures, a lot of countries bought into something, a model that they didn't realize at the time was actually going to be destroying the planet. And now is the time for for us, I think, to step back and say, wait a minute, <laughs> maybe this wasn't such a good idea. It's interesting, going back to this idea of the war of ideas and how the billionaire class has been able to fund the neoliberal view it seems like changing people's ways of thinking costs a lot of money. Maybe the Chinese have something to offer that could be circulated globally. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think I've been misunderstood. <laughs> I've seen some reviews of that book that have said, you know, while well, Parks is a Xi Jinping fan and he's promoting the, the <laughs> Communist Party and so on. No, I'm not. I'm just saying they've got the right ideas when they the say ideas. that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that it's the ideas that I think are important. And and those ideas, yes, certainly. I mean, and, and this is something I think that, that I would say in Xi Jinping's favor, that he grew up in a, in a milieu whereby the Confucian idea that you live modestly, that accumulating riches is likely to lead you off astray. You're likely to, the dollar signs or dancing in your eyes are likely to obscure from you what's actually going on. And two, these philosophies are philosophies of moderation, of sufficiency. We have them in our tradition with the Stoics, the Epicureans, and so on. But it's a very obvious very far away from individualist, let's get rich capitalism, I have to say that I think that he hasn't been very successful, but that certainly Xi Jinping has not been happy with vast displays of wealth and opulence. They've been trying to rein that in because, of course, many Chinese have become very rich and for some reason, when you get really rich, you have to flaunt it. <laughs> to show that you're that rich. And yeah, I think there's a there's a strain in his thinking that's still there that says, oh, what he says it. He says the goal of China is to become a moderately prosperous society by 2049. It's hmm. not to become the richest society in the world, but just we want people to have a, a decent standard of living. And so I do think there are Unlike the West, the modern West, where Thatcher and Reagan would say there is no society, it's quite different in the Chinese view that human society, the network of relationships, is this relationality way of thinking, is uh, this idea of being in harmony with nature and natural forces, the idea of governing in a way that has a duty and you have to be educated. And mm. can you say a little bit more about how this may help us in terms of rethinking our, our relational approach to nature? Yes. I mean, I think that, what's the best way to put it? Yeah, it's huge. <laughs> but if we could take another from, two hours just on that yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, we certainly could. Because <laughs> I think one way to put it that, that maybe could can catch people's attention is to look at the social contract that we that we think of as being central to politics in the West. That somehow what you have is a bunch of individuals and they come together 
and agree to give up certain freedoms in return for certain security and so on and so forth. And the Chinese look at that and they say, man, this is completely backwards. Because for them, what's basic is the web of interconnections, that, that it's that relational, that, that a world full of interactivity, and it all hangs together. You mentioned systems theory earlier, and we see that now with Earth system theory, especially that our science is finally, it took a long time for, despite all the advances in Western science, for us to come up with the idea of ecology, a science of ecology that wasn't until yes. the 19th century. And then Earth system science is much more recent, a few decades yes. ago. And now we're be really beginning to get the hang of things to see how they work. And the Chinese be saying, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. Interdependence and also the flow of energies as well. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so how do we, yeah, how do we, one, one, one thing that really strikes me, um, that if you say, okay, people ask, so what are the major differences between the Western philosophical traditions and, say, the East Asian ones? And I think that one of the uh, one of the points of difference is that in political philosophy, um, in the West, we look at the polis, we look at the uh, at civilization as if it were in a vacuum, as if it were just floating somewhere. And mm. that we haven't really taken into account the larger context, which is the earth system, you know, is, is the environment, the natural environment. Whereas in the Chinese, now I think, I think you get some of that in Plato. It comes up occasionally in the Western tradition, but it's not really, it, it, it's, it's really not, not a major issue. But you look at the Chinese tradition, they always see the human place is between heaven and earth. We are a result of the interactions of those great powers. And any ruler, any emperor or king or whatever, has to take full account of that context in deciding how to run the, the country, how to, how, to, how to do politics. And mm. they, nev they never lost that. that was a, that's a really important um, thing. And I think if you lose it, as we did in the West, you end up with a situation where we are now, where we realize, okay, we've got a civilization that's high tech and everyone is, is going to be very happy eventually at some point. But wait, we're in, we've been doing damage to the context that we live in, that any political entity operates within, which is the natural world. Mm -hmm. And if, if you lose that sense of context, and that's in general, I think, something, again, in the Asian traditions, where we tend to get a bit focused on figure and not look at the ground so much, or we look at the individual thing that's happening and not at the context, whereas Buddhism or Taoism or, or, or these Asian philosophies say, no, what, you've got to broaden your vision and ask, mm -hmm. what is the... Uh, the largest relevant context to making any particular decision. We're talking really then about a really dramatic change in our Western vision, and that mm. this wider vision of the Chinese Asian philosophies really can be quite helpful. I think you used the term in Confucian philosophy that you have the idea of that we're all under the heavens, right? Mm. Is that this mm -hmm. all encompassing? view, but at the same time, they also have this extended sense of reciprocity or responsibility towards the past with ancestors and to future mm -hmm. generations. So it's both spatial and temporal in terms of its scope. Right, it right, right, exactly, exactly. No, the, 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 I think these philosophies are valuable because they acknowledge that spatio-temporal context and yeah, and Confucian political philosophy was has always been insanely ambitious in that it says we're looking beyond the nation state or the nation, the people or whatever you call it. We're seeing it in not only the interaction among different states, but rather all under the heavens, which is the whole show. 
the natural world, the human world, history, civilization, and so on. And, you know, another very important image in the Chinese tradition, and it's in all the various Chinese philosophies, is that, that we as humans form one body with all things. Mm. That, that there's a focus on the body as a totality functioning within a context where you say, okay, and then broaden that out to how the whole thing works. That, that sounds a little the, uh, the, as above, so below in the uh, Western Africa. What, where did that come from? Uh, yes, as right above? in in Paracelsus and the yeah the more the Hermetic tradition. Yeah, I mean this is the thing also that that is important to mention that that I'm not wanting su to suggest that we should all become Confucians and then everything will be <laughs> hunky dory, but rather that we shift away a bit from our individualism towards the more Confucian idea of it's all interaction and interbeing and, and so on. And I do make the point in the book that, because I also thought, I was, it was the one point at which I was thinking commercially or I'm thinking, look, a book, especially if I want to sell a few copies in the United States, a book that says, well, our salvation lies in Chinese philosophy and Chinese philosophy alone, that's not going to that's not going to do very well. But well, I think well, you, the well point, you do bring in the Western ancient Greek Stoics. Yes, and, right, uh, right, right. And I was, and I, think I was really surprised how, just struck how ecological much of their mm. vision of the universe was. Yeah, very participatory yeah. n notion of the universe. Right. So and I, I think that's, yeah, that's for me the value of taking the Chinese tradition seriously, seeing all these patterns and all these, uh, this putting relationality and interactivity front and center. But then we realize, no, actually, we have that in our own tradition. Works Epicureans, Spinoza is a major figure there. And then I think coming up to people like Nietzsche, where you see, no, we've got it in our tradition too, but these are we have it from people who have been relatively marginalized. So it's not been mm -hmm. the mainstream. And, and then you have the German romantic philosophers and romanticism too. Yeah. As kind yeah, of sure. Counter right. Yeah, exactly. And people like von Humboldt, for example, who really first saw the ecology, the, the global, looking at things globally and seeing it all hang together in a sense. And so, yeah, I think that's one of the most valuable things about taking Chinese philosophy seriously is that it illuminates these streams in currents of thought in our own tradition that have mainly been ignored or sent off to the margins. And again, in the US, Thoreau and, and Emerson, and for example. The transcendentalist, are, are, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, they, they had it right in many, many ways. I think it's important to point out this last part of your book. To me, it was my most favorite reading. But I think it, it's really important because we're talking about increasing human fulfillment as a way of compensating for consumption. In other words, if we're more fulfilled with just being who we are, then the need or desire for consuming is going to decrease. Mm -hmm. And so why Chinese philosophy? Why ancient Greek Stoicism? I think it's speaking that this alienation that we have is not just towards nature, but it's to, to ourselves as well. Mm -hmm. our own, the nature mm -hmm. of our own mind, we're alienated for our own being. Right, and, right. And, and so these philosophies weren't just philosophy. They were an embodied practice that had a transformative effect on human consciousness. So did you want to speak a bit about that? Too? Yes, right. I mean, no, this brings up a, a really important aspect of the libertarian idea, which is these people are radical post-Cartesians. They think if Elon Musk thinks that he can survive in outer space, you know, then he's already thinking of himself as a mind and not a body, because his body is not going to survive. And, you know, and you see it also in their ambition to, well, if we can't establish a good colony on the moon or on Mars, at least we'll upload the contents of our magnificent brains to the cloud somewhere. In a singularity. <laughs> yeah. 
Right. Again, good, good, good luck with that. Uh, but, but yeah, it shows how Cartesian they are and how they, they think they can do just fine without a body. And I think that the East Asian traditions and especially East Asian philosophy is always rooted in some kind of somatic practice. You, you don't just, it's not just a matter of, of using your brain. It's a matter of doing things. Of doing things, of being. In fact, mind is often referred to as heart mind, right? Yeah, yeah, and it's a it, and it's a matter of the whole notion of ritual propriety in the Confucian tradition m- means how do you behave? How do you handle the ritual implements? How do you shake? How do you bow to someone? How do you shake their hand and so on? And so it's all rooted in in our corporeality, our being embodied, and. If we get that part of it, and if we see that, unfortunately, the body doesn't hold together forever, (laughs) in my case, it's rapidly falling apart, you realize it's all impermanent too, but we, we do what we can, and a fulfilled life does not have to do necessarily with being in a society where gross domestic product is the only measure of how well you're doing. Because there's many, to go back to where we started in the 70s, where the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and so on, this was government regulation putting a limit on what corporations could do. And their complaint was always, ah, but it will reduce GDP. Well, fine. That's that's because, you know, you can have a higher GDP and everyone can be miserable. And so we're missing what through that obsession with economics, we're missing what you just referred to as a fulfilled human life. What does that consist in? That's why I have a problem with the term human flourishing, that that term has been co-opted by the positive psychology and happiness industries in a way that Mm -hmm. it becomes a neoliberal reductionism to atomized individuals who are seeking their own happiness. Uh, right, or right. their own personal fulfillment, which is a very vague notion to begin with. And so I'm glad that you qualified that very well. And this idea of the legacy of Cartesianism, I think there's something, one more point I th- I'd like to bring up is that, so we have, we have this kind of worldview of that it's largely an insentient external world out there. The, the physical world is this just this stuff. It's inanimate and lifeless, right? It's inert. And so we're looking at things through the instrumental lens, like what use can I put these things to for me, you know? Uh, whereas even with Plato, and like you mentioned, there was a much more animated sense that the whole world was ensouled and it was a participatory relational universe. And is, that seems like something that we're struggling to reclaim in some way. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think that this notion of we are the only beings who matter because we're made in the image of God or we're the only ones that have souls, sort of post-Cartesian idea, damn, it, it makes the world a pretty, not such a hospitable place but if we look at the history of it, that post that Cartesian idea is so parochial, it's so recent, it's a Northern European notion that's only been around a few hundred years. And you look at the rest of human society, of human philosophy, of human thinking, that all other cultures and civilizations that I'm acquainted with, at least, of course. The whole world is ensouled. It's all animated. There's a distinction between animate and inanimate is a conventional one, useful for certain purposes, but it doesn't really get to where we're at. And I think of my laptop. I was having a problem the other day because I had a deadline to meet. And as usual, it's, it's silicon-based. It's not carbon. I don't understand how it picks up on my mood. There are not even any moving parts. But it was acting up because I mean, I was, my mood was inappropriate. Uh, and, you know, that's not an illusion, I think, that if we see the world as, I mean, if we stop 
the notion, if we say, okay, our love, which is a good thing, right, for human beings to have, stops at, if it doesn't stop at human beings, it stops at animals. Or maybe my car. I don't have a car, but people who have cars might love their car. But I mean, this goes back to James Hillman. He's saying, no, no, don't stop there. That the whole world is, in principle, deserving of our love. The, the rocks, the tractors, the, <laughs> the the things that we live with. I, I think it's really important to realize because I think our dysfunctional relationship with so-called inanimate things is a big part of our problem because it means we're we're suffocating the world in plastic. We buy things and throw them away and so on. This notion, I, I really like the notion of befriending things because, mm. you know, how many friends can you have? I suppose on Facebook, I don't know, you can have hundreds, <laughs> but, but in my Thousands. life, I can, only, I, can, <laughs> right, I can only have a few and and because then I can spend time with them. And if you only have... 13 things in your home, you know, it's easy to befriend them because you never lose them. If there's only 13 of them, you can't possibly lose them. And I think, I, I think you're right. I think that notion of that we live in a world that is just dead molecules in motion, that's cold and inanimate and so on. Yeah, I, ooh, no, that's not the kind of world I want to live in. And I think if we look at the philosophies, especially in East Asian philosophy, these aren't primitive animists, these people. These are very sophisticated Confucian, Taoist, Neo-Confucian philosophers who are saying to us, it's all one body. It's all alive. It's all, take it seriously. And, and it was a notion of sympathetic resonance with all that is alive. Yes, that yes. even mind was all pervasive too. Right, right, of. right. No, I think that's a powerful idea and that we see it, I think we get it somewhat in, in people like Spinoza and in Nietzsche to an extent in the West, but it's very central in the East Asian traditions and that's something we can definitely learn from. Well, connected to the Cartesian legacy is, it seems like also suffering from a hangover of the deist, that God is this great machine maker right? Mm, and that just mm -hmm, set in mm -hmm. motion. And that uh, seems to be behind a, a lot of people's thinking as well. Right, right. And that, yeah, the mechanistic. The uh, mechanistic. Uh, yeah, of, of how things work is, it's obviously, so obviously a projection of the human ability, it goes back to Prometheus in a way, to develop technologies that exert tremendous power over the natural world. And we mm -hmm. see it all over now that human mechanisms <laughs> are capable of destroying the Brazilian rainforest. They're very powerful. But man, that's a very narrow idea of what the world is and a very peculiar one coming from a certain mindset coming out of the scientific revolution in the West. And most people in most of human history would look at it and say, what are you talking about? It's a mechanism, for heaven's sake. Get a life. No, it's And you, you've brought up Nietzsche, and you are a scholar of Nietzsche as well. And he's basically, I mean, in terms of understanding this through his eyes, is that we seem to be distance. We don't have an intimacy with the world at large, if you want to put it, that we're somehow trapped in our concepts or in language, mm. which creates this artificial sense of distance and alienation. Is that something that you found in Nietzsche's work? Yes, yes, definitely. At one point with that climate crisis book, I had to cut it by 40%. And oh, one wow. reviewer said, too much Nietzsche, too much Marx. And so okay. I dutifully took out a lot of Nietzsche and a lot of Marx. I said, okay, I can say that somewhere else. But I think, no, I think Nietzsche is great on that because in his middle period, he has this idea of, he talks about becoming good neighbors with the closest things, mm. or good neighbors again with the closest things. And he says, man, philosophers, they're talking about the absolute, they're talking about world spirit and so on. They talk about all, all kinds of stuff that doesn't even exist. Are they talking about food, diet, environment, 
clothing. He said, that's the really important stuff, the stuff you deal with on a day-to-day basis and the things you use, teacups, coffee cups, forks, and so on, you act with bodily on a daily basis. He said, that stuff is really important. That sounds and very Doganish that, to me. Well, exactly. <laughs> and in fact, that's what I'm having to write about right now is exactly. I think Nietzsche and Dogen are remarkably similar on that, mm-hmm. that you need to really, this is where it's at. Your mm. interaction with the world, when it's mediated by bowls and robes and forks and knives and so on, that these smallest, nearest things are really important for our for our flourishing and not i mean sorry i want to go back when you mentioned human flourishing that i think one of the great for me one of the great things about your book the mindfulness is that you show how the mindfulness movement actually reinforces this neoliberal understanding of ourselves as individuals. And that's, you could say the whole of, I think James Hillman says it, in fact, that the whole of psychotherapy, if it's only concerned with adjusting ourselves to the way things are, it's totally failing because Hillman says, no, wait, the problems are in the world, not in, not in my soul. They're in the, the whole world. The, pollution. the whole world yeah. is sick. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, um, yeah, that was a great book. I, I actually had an undergraduate class in psychology that focused on Hillman. And, uh, oh, really? Huh. I, I remember reading, we've had a hundred years of psychotherapy and the world's getting worse. Yes, right. right. That's, yeah, that's a really good book. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, um, the $64 question, and oh boy, I shouldn't be using a monetary metaphor, I guess. It's <laughs> very, very American of me, I guess, but um, the crucial- Well, at least it's 64 rather than 64,000, which I think okay. could be worse. <laughs> well, yeah, I think we're. I think you're already addressing this here, I was, but I was going to ask, so how do we cultivate and embody or inhabit this more intip- intimate, more interdependent- relational way of knowing and being, or how do we make this experiential and existential? So it's not just some new concept that we entertain intellectually, but can really affect our actual perception and our way of yeah. being in the world. And I think you were already touching on this when you talked about befriending what's closest mm. to us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. did you want to mm-hmm. add to that? Well, yeah, as my daughter would say, easy for me to say because I don't have a smartphone, so I can't throw it away. <laughs> I, I do have a little phone from the 1990s, but I think we have to, we have to put those away for a while because if our experience is so so much of our experience is mediated through screens, then we're not seeing things. I mean, we see, I I think many people see screens as something that opens up. Oh, it's a window to a farther world and so on. I always want to say, look, what's the original meaning of a screen is something that closes things off. A fire screen keeps you from the fire. A screen standing Chinese screen in a room prevents you from seeing what's going on in this corner of it or whatever. What are we using the screens of our phones to to conceal? What do we want to conceal from ourselves? And I think if we put the phone down and pay attention to what's right around us here and now, again, that's a Nietzsche and a Dogen kind of a point. It's we're, I'm afraid we're losing that as a culture, that we're really not paying attention. And it's why... Things like when people are touting augmented reality, I want to say, yeah, but look, we've already got just the ordinary reality, 1.0. I mean, do we understand how that works? I don't think so. So there are, as you've talked about, that we have engaged in and so on, that just bring you back to here we are in a particular situation, we are two bodies separated by how many <laughs> thousand miles you're in San Francisco, I'm in Vienna. It's a miracle and it's wonderful. I'm not, I wouldn't have it any other way, but it would be wonderful if we could actually get ourselves in the same place at some point. That would be a very different experience. And so, yeah, I think that 
to accept our embodiment and to not just accept it, but to actually celebrate it by being in places without our phones, where we are fully there and paying attention to what's going on. It's, yeah, as I said, reality 1.0. We don't even know what that is yet, it seems to me, because we, we're not, you know, we're always overlooking it. And I think Nietzsche is good on that point too, where he says we don't see it because we're always have this instrumental view towards things that we're wanting some result from it and so on. And that we don't have time or patience to then realize what exactly is going on right around us now. And I think if you're my wife's a painter. If you're a painter, for example, you look at a if you're Cezanne, you look at a jug or a pear or a mountain for a few months, a few years, and then, <laughs> and then you think, okay, now I know enough to paint it because I see it properly. I see it aside from the labels and so on. And I think those are interesting. Those give us interesting hints as to how we might lead lives that are more fulfilled. That was great. And I think that's a good place to end. And I want to thank you for your time and generosity and sharing your ideas and I hope people will pick up your book, How to Think About the Climate Crisis by Graham Parks. And thank you for joining us today on the podcast. Well, thank you, Ron. The pleasure has been mine, and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you about these things. This is the Mindful Cranks podcast. I hope you like our new look and feel. And check out our webpage at www.mindfulcranks.com. And subscribe to the Cranks newsletter to learn about upcoming guests and other events. The Mindful Cranks is pretty much on every podcast platform. Please rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you are so inclined. That's it for now. I'll be back soon with another amazing guest. Thanks for listening. Mm